So in my presentation, I'm going to be talking about migration policy responses in recent years, give you a bit of context. Um, then I'm going to briefly talk about migrant decision making and the research that I've done in recent years. Um, but then ask a question what this means for policy. And um, the work I'm presenting today is based on a few studies I did um, a few years ago called um, Journeys to Europe and Journeys on Hold, both of which um, I think I've presented here actually. Um, and they're both looking at um, migrant decision making and the role of policies in shaping um, migrant decision making. I um, brought some copies of those reports along, but then left them at Melissa's house, unfortunately. But they'll be in Melissa's house from tomorrow, um, office from tomorrow. So you can pick, pick a copy up if you're interested. Um, and it's also based on a paper that I wrote um, with Heaven Crawley um, on um, the determinants of the where to go. Um, but then basically, I'm working on a paper, a policy paper on um, what migrant decision making means for policy, so I'm also drawing on that, but that is a paper which I haven't published yet, because I need to find time to, to work on it and finalise it. So doing this presentation is actually really great, because it just forces me to re-engage with that paper. Um, so I'm going to start with a bit of context. Um, so. 2015 was the year that migration, I think, became mainstream and you would have seen lots of pictures like the top one um, in, in the press at the time, still actually, um, on the so-called refugee migration crisis and a lot of stories um, focused on, on floods and storms and invasions of people um, and that year more than a million people crossed the Mediterranean to go to Europe. Um, Yet, at, um, as all the researchers in this room were know, it wasn't really a crisis um, in the absolute sense. Um, developing countries hosted more than 85% of, of refugees um, and less than 6% of Syrian refugees actually came to Europe. But 2015 was a year where um, the number of refugees and other migrants did increase in Europe. Um, so you'll see that on the Eurostat chart, Eurostat chart and the biggest spike is 2015 um, and this was for a number of reasons that um, the, the, the war in Syria had been going on for um, I think around five years by then. Um, so refugees started realizing that they had limited um, livelihood, op op livelihood opportunities in the region, limited um, opportunities for a good future. Um, new routes became um, available, the, for example the Balkan route, which I just heard Katie is also working on a project on, on, on that. Um, and also um, certain routes became um, more normalized and people started taking higher risks. Numbers have since slowed down, you'll see quite dramatically actually on that chart. Um, but still the so-called migration crisis has left big um, lasting consequences, has had big effects, for example, on the narratives around migration, which have changed very much since then, but also on policy making in much of Europe. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. Um, so um, Europe has um, responded to the migration crisis in, in a number of ways, um, and I'm going to talk about two main responses. Um, and um, one is one response is deterrence and greater securitization. The second response is tackling root causes through development aid. Um, so, in, in terms of direct control measures, this is a very obvious response. Um, one that policymakers um, started prioritizing straight away, and this is about trying to keep people from coming to Europe. So, keeping them. Um, stopping them at, at their borders. So in 2015, um, European countries started building wars again, for example, um, for example, Hungary, um, and um, European countries started spending huge sums of, of money on that. So for example, an ODI study found that once um, other aspects of border call are included, like identity checks, 
surveillance, deportation, border policing, all of that, conservative estimate is that at least 17 um, billion was committed by European countries between 2014 to 16 in an effort to reduce flows. Um, and in total, um, uh, uh, sorry, and then the, the other um, chart is a related study by an organization called Por Causa, um, which shows Frontex expenditure, um, and it shows that um, um, funding for Frontex, which is Europe's border agency, has been increasing for year after year after the so-called migration crisis. Both of these studies also show that actually transparency of this kind of data is poor and these figures um, seem to be underestimates of actual expenditure. Um, so there are plenty of examples of these direct control measures. Um, for example, Hungary is of course a, a, a literal direct control measure. Um, but then you'd also find deterrence measures um, for example, Britain withdrew funding from Mare Nostrum rescue missions in 2015 um, to what they, ca what they called to not support pull factors to Europe. Um, another example is um, the Danish government took out um, ads in Lebanese newspapers. Um, I think this was around 2015 um, to tell them about more stringent asylum conditions in Denmark, um, so they said you, you, your um, social benefits will be lower than they used to be. So again, um, trying to stop people from, from coming to, to, to Europe, to Denmark. Um, so in my research, I've looked at the question whether such an approach worked. Um, and for example, we asked, can deterrence measures like fences change someone's mind about migrating to Europe? Um, and in the study, Journeys to Europe, um, we um, looked at the decision-making processes of um, recently arrived Eritreans, Syrians, and Senegalese, and we found that these deterrence measures actually rarely feature as part of their um, motives for migration. Um, these decisions are driven by conflict, by economic opportunities, by insecurity at home, but also aspirations for a better future. We also found that information about deterrence measures and anti-migration messages rarely featured in, the, in their decisions. Um, for one, one reason was that people made their decisions on the basis of what they called trusted information, and trusted information came from other sources like family and friends, and um, governments in receiving countries are just not part of these social networks. We found that at best, um, direct control measures um, can divert the flow of migrants, basically passing the buck from one country to the next. So they might not go to one country um, where it's now harder to get to, but they're still trying to go to another country. Um, so that's also what that, that quote illustrates, um, and also what's shown in, in this migration journey. Um, and I think your research, Katie, I think actually has quite quite similar findings too. Um, so second set of um, policy responses are um, on um, deterring, trying to prevent um, migration from happening in the first place. Um, so of the 17 billion um, that was spent in 2014 to 17, um, around 15 billion was spent outside Europe. Um, and this set of policies has focused on tackling the so-called root causes of migration um, and um, trying to um, convince people to um, stay in countries of origin, to stay on in countries of transit um, by um, through so-called development and sometimes um, that can be quite general and just say, well, we're going to improve economic circumstances in a country. In other cases, it would be channeled into very specific programs like livelihood, um, livelihood type programs, um, training programs, um, and um, for example, um, jobs compacts fall under that, um, migration partnership frameworks. Um, so it's basically um, the, these programs would have a host of, yeah, they'd have different objectives like um, 
fostering economic development in general, job creation, often with the implicit or explicit um, objective to prevent migration from these countries. Um, again, um, plenty of examples. I've um, included pictures from um, livelihood programs targeted at, um, um, I think, aspiring migrants or at groups who might potentially be migrants. Um, and then I've also included a quote which we came um, which we came across in our Ethiopia research, um, which I think was a quote from the Dutch ambassador at the time. Um, from one of her speeches when she um, officially opened, I think, a, a training program for Eritreans in, in Ethiopia. Um, and the Ethiopia study, we did the report called Journeys on Hold, um, again looked at the question of whether such an approach works. We looked at um, Eritrean migrants um, who live in Ethiopia and we looked at their decisions about onward migration. Um, and we focused on um, livelihoods programs in terms of the policies we looked at, but also um, resettlement program programming. And um, we found that livelihoods programming addressed the <coughs> symptoms, perhaps, but not the underlying causes of people's migrations. Um, so, for example, we found that um, livelihood programs, depending on how they were designed and implemented, they tended to be okay in terms of covering people's basic needs and um, giving them some protection, um, but at the same time, they had no prospects for a better future, no autonomy or other kind of opportunities at the time, Eritrean migrants were still prevented from actually accessing the labor market in, in Ethiopia, um, so had very, very few job prospects. Uh, we also found that often these trainings are not tailored at all to refugee skills, experiences, or, um, or actually the, the demands, um, the labor demand, um, the lab or the labor market more generally, um, and this is also something you find in, um, in a lot of these programs. And then, yeah, the, the key underlying issue was that um, Eritrean migrants just didn't have the right to work. Um, in terms of um, resettlement programming, um, we found that this um, was something that most Eritreans um, were interested in. It's a very popular um, many people applied for these um, and were initially quite hopeful, um, but then um, we found that this effect dissipated over time. Um, so basically, um, as people lost trust in the resettlement pro um, process, as they saw it would take a long time, they didn't know if they would ever be resettled, um, as they lacked the information about the process, um, irregular migration became a more tolerable option and, um, and um, resettlement ultimately isn't enough to prevent people um, from migrating onwards in the long term. So, summing up, um, we, have, we see a growing trend towards preventative and restrictive migration policies. Um, but we also know that these have not always been effective in terms of preventing people from moving in the first place, preventing people from moving on or coming to Europe. Um, there have been um, lots of studies that have looked at the reasons why these policies haven't been effective. Um, one answer can be that non-migration policies play a bigger role than migration policies. Um, so, for example, economic opportunities and the role of education um, are often more important in terms of shaping people's decisions than, for example, where the asylum process is easier. Um, so that's one reason often historical ties shape migration flows. So all of these can be reasons why these preventative and restrictive um, migration policies haven't been working. <coughs> 
Um, but um, what I want to write about in my paper is that I think these policies are also ineffective because they're based on superficial assumptions of why people leave and how they make decisions. Often the policies are based on, on very simple push-pull models and, um, and based on assumptions of rational, very economic thinking of migrants, um, but they neglect the role of a whole range of more social factors and intervening um, factors that, that shape um, migrants' decisions as well. Um, so um, I'm going to argue that migration policies that aim to reduce irregular migration and to stimulate safe and orderly migration, as for example the Migration Compact talks about, um, along legal pathways, they need to take account of migrant decision making. Um, so in other words, it's important for policymakers to understand um, people's aspirations, their behaviours and their decision making processes to develop more effective migration policies. And um, that's um, the focus of the rest of my presentation. Um, I'm first going to um, briefly talk about um, the factors that shape migrant decision making um, and then I will um, go into a framework which I've developed to help policy makers understand how and why um, migrant decision making um, feeds into their policy processes. Um, so in my work but also the work of, um, of many others on migrant decision making I've um, broken down the decision to migrate or migrant decision making into three separate decisions. Um, one decision is around whether to go, the next one is around where to go and the next, then the final one is how to get there. And they're not, those decisions are not necessarily taken in that order and they are of course also interrelated and um, sometimes um, migrants would um, take a decision um, of two factors or even all factors at the same time um, but um, it does make sense to actually break it down into these separate decisions because often different factors and policies um, affect different aspects of that decision separately um, so it's quite important to, to see um, how they um, potentially affect um, these, these factors. Um, so in terms of the first decision, whether to go, um, it's um, migration happens when um, people want um, to see a change in their life, when they have, a, have an aspiration for change. Um, this is based on, on the work by um, Jürgen Karling, by the way, and taken from our mid-next proposal. Um, so this is very much the kind of work that we're going to be looking at in the mid-next project, so looking at life aspirations um, and these life aspirations could be for something entirely different. It doesn't need to be migration, um, but it, it um, could be migration. Um, so that's basically the next step. Um, so, but first of all, where, do, where does a desire for change come from? Well, the desire for change comes from these root causes. So it could be um, bad circumstances like, um, like conflict, political, economic insecurity, um, human rights abuses, all of, those, um, all of those root causes could lead to a desire for change. But I think it's just really important to point out that this desire for change doesn't necessarily result in uh, um, aspirations for migration. Um, I think where it becomes interesting for policymakers where that is where that desi desire for change results in migration aspirations. I think that's an area um, which they could potentially <coughs> be interested in and um, which I think they already try and um, influence. Um, but then even if people have migration aspirations, as I'm sure you've um, all know, it doesn't necessarily result in migration. Um, um, it can result in involuntary immobility, but also um, migration attempts often fail. And um, migration is only realized when people have the ability and the capacity to migrate. So they have the right networks, they have, um, they have the funding, um, they have their family support, um, and they, um, they can access the migration infrastructure and um, know about pathways to information. 
So I think that's once it starts getting that concrete, that's where the where to go decision um, starts coming in and also the how to get there. Um, so in terms of where to go, um, I've written um, a paper with Heaven Crawley which looked at um, how, um, which looked at what shapes um, migrants' decisions and migrants' preferences on destinations. Um, and it's, I, I, yeah, it's published in International Migration and I'm happy to, to send it to you. Um, and we found that, of course, lots of different factors at the uh, micro, at the meso and macro level shape destination preferences. So um, at the macro level, things like historical ties, languages, shared languages, all of that came up. Um, but also geographical distances with people usually going to countries which are closer by. Um, then we also looked at policy factors um, and for example we found that um, welfare states um, generally don't act as a pool factor for migrants. Um, that's um, often part of um, political rhetorics but um, there's actually very little um, evidence for um, um, policies around social protection acting as, as pool factors. Um, then, of course, um, migration policies, quite a few studies have focused on that in recent years to see if they shape people's destination preferences and decisions. Um, and the evidence there is mixed. I would say some studies um, do find um, some links between migrant decisions and migration policies, but often that's only for specific subgroups and also only certain aspects of a policy. So it wouldn't be all aspects of migration policies. Um, but for example, I think your work finds that it's only positive migration policies that influence people's decisions, but not negative policies which are more about deterrence, right? If I remember correctly, your Greece <laughs> work. <laughs> um, and um, some of the more recent work has also looked at how exactly um, these policies in shape people's preferences around migration. And um, we found that um, in most cases migrants actually lack very precise knowledge on these policies. Um, it, the information they had was often word of mouth and um, it often looked quite different to the actual policies. And um, what we found is that perceptions of those policies are much more important than the actual content. So that's why I wrote perceptions trump con um, content. And what I've put on there is an interview I did um, with, I think, a Syrian migrant in Berlin. Um, this must have been maybe July 2015. What's really important to know is that this, is, this interview was conducted before Merkel made that decision. Um, in, I think that must have been um, in August or September of that year where Syrians then started coming to numbers, um, to, to Germany in larger numbers. Um, but basically that migrant at the time already had the perception that in Berlin fingerprints are ignored so you're not returned back to Hungary. Um, so again this was not what the actual policy was but um, his perception of the policy and that was a reason for him to, to come to Berlin specifically. Um, so where policies come into play, often it's the interpretations and perceptions of those um, policies which matter rather than um, the actual content. And um, this is something I will also come back to later in my framework because I think that's actually a really crucial aspect for policymakers to take into account. <coughs> Um, so then the final um, part of the decision, the how to get there. Um, so for a very long time, people didn't really think about this aspect and um, migration um, was seen as a movement from A to B and people didn't really think about what happened in between. Um, but um, looking at these journeys is actually very important because often the uh, profoundly formative experience and the journeys themselves can change people's aspirations, they can change their plans, but also their migration outcomes. Um, so 
especially for migrants who um, don't have, um, don't migrate on legal migration pathways, the journey can often take a long time. It's often a stepwise migration process where they decide to move to another country, often close by initially, um, with the full intention of, of staying there and um, making a future in that place, um, but then moving on when they're unable to make a future for themselves in that place. Um, we found in our research, and others have also found this, that plans change and decisions evolve over the course of a migration journey, often as a response to external circumstances. Um, and, um, for example, other people at Maastricht have looked at the role of um, good or bad luck in shaping decisions, and, and often um, bad luck or good luck can, can change the entire direction of a journey. Um, people's journeys and the decisions they make along the way are also shaped by their willingness to take risks. Um, and um, migrants seem to tolerate um, migrants who are on these irregular journeys um, are of course already self-selected and um, they seem to tolerate quite um, high levels of risk along, along the road um, because of um, for example, long experience of conflict already back home um, but also because the potential benefits of a better future seem worth taking compared to the, the um, current experiences to um, the, the conflict or the um, lack of opportunities they face. Um, but of course different people are, um, have a different willingness to take risks so that can very much uh, also shape people's decisions along the way. Um, so, um, what does that mean for policy? Um, why, um, why does this matter to policymakers? So, a study of migrant decision making allows us to understand why policies are often inf ineffective. Um, one reason I've mentioned is that other policy areas are often um, more important, but also um, I think the brief snapshot I just showed you of migrant decision making showed that migration decisions are often a messy, they can um, messy process, they can look irrational, um, they, they're quite subjective um, based on people's perceptions and interpretations. Um, also saw that journeys themselves influence um, migration outcomes. It's really important to not just consider um, migration decision making at one point in time, but to actually um, see it as an evolving process, something that happens often over and over again and to, to see that those future decisions might look differently. Yep, that's fine. Um, and also important to keep in mind that it's often um, a coming together of a range of factors. So it's not one reason why people um, go to, to one particular place, but it's, it's a whole range of factors. Um, and then, um, so I think um, policies are ineffective because they're based on flawed assumptions, why, uh, how migrant decision making works, and I think that results in a chasm between how the policy looks on paper, how it's meant to work, and how it influences people in real life. Um, and um, I'm going to show you a framework on the next slide um, which basically shows how the content of um, migration policies is diluted, it's changed, it's transformed at different stages of its cycle. Um, so this is a framework um, which I've put together um, and it's based on um, a conceptual framework developed by Matthias Trecker and Heinde de Haas. Um, which also considers the effectiveness of migration policy and they basically look at the first two stages, so the first box um, and they basically argue that an implementation gap can limit the effectiveness of policy um, and um, in my paper I'm going to argue that there are two further gaps, the communication gap and the perception gap. Um, so this framework shows the gradual transformation of policy um, to 
format, how it was um, how it was designed and um, how it looks on paper to how it looks like to migrants and how it's interpreted by them. So the first stage um, is the implement implementation gap between the policy on paper and the policy that's eventually implemented. Um, and um, often they don't look the same um, and you can have implementation gaps because of um, financial and human resources, um, because of competing policy priorities, but also because of discretion of government officials. Um, so that can explain why policies are not fully implemented or not implemented at all or implemented, implemented slightly differently to how they were conceived. Um, then there's also a communication gap, um, information on the aims and content of um, policies often doesn't filter down to migrants, um, information gets lost or distorted along the way um, and um, many of us have found that migrants frequently have no or very li limited information on, on migration policies. And I would say, in, in all fairness, my, um, policymakers are aware of this gap, and this is a gap that they have been trying to address um, for years. Um, for example, information campaigns have gained in popularity in recent years, and there are now lots of different kinds of um, information campaigns, um, often focused, though, on, on the dangers of irregular journeys. Um, there have been a few studies now that looked at the effectiveness of these information campaigns and they found that sadly they also do often don't affect uh, migrant decision making and for a number of reasons often they're targeted at a broad um, group of people and then they focus on um, general risk of migration rather than um, specific policies um, and also um, they usually don't give information about legal pathways alongside um, these general messages of the dangers of irregular migration, which means that um, migrants don't trust them. And then finally, there's the perception gap, which I talked about before. So um, perceptions and people's inter interpretations of policies are often quite different. Um, and um, this is because migration um, decisions are very personal, very subjective process and often these subjective um, intangible factors that you can't really measure um, are much more important. Um, finally, I just wanted to say that um, people's aspirations, they also very much color people's interpretations of policies. I think in a way people also choose which policies they want to understand or which they want to know about. Um, so that also explains why migration policies are often um, of relatively minor importance compared to, um, for example, policies around um, access to work or education. And um, I think this final gap is the one that's um, most neglected by policymakers, but also at the same time the hardest to address. Um, and I think that's where it becomes the most apparent that um, policymakers really need to understand how migrant decision making works if they want their policies to have the effects they intend to achieve. Um, so I'm just going to end with some implications for policymakers. Um, so as I said, it's important to understand people's um, aspirations, their, um, their motivations for migration, but also their perceptions of, of policies and the situation, um, and to develop um, effective, well-targeted policies. It's um, crucial to understand these aspirations and processes. Um, uh, it's important to understand the policy transformation process and I think it can actually be used to find specific policy entry points for improvements. Um, so for example, around the communication gap, around the perceptions gap, um, it is possible to, to find policy entry points. And then finally, really important to look beyond migration policies. Um, um, often, as I said, it's broader public policies that shape people's decisions. Um, so if, migrant, uh, if, if policymakers want to influence um, migrant decision making, 
they need to cast the net much wider than just pure migration policies, um, but also um, start looking at labor market policies more generally, um, and basically have a whole of government approach rather than working in their own silos. Um, just very briefly, um, this is an area myself and others are still working on. It's work in progress, but also the focus of um, two five-year projects, which I've recently started working on. One is the MIGNEX project, which is about aligning um, my, the migration development nexus and migration management. So very much looking at um, looking at um, these um, types of questions um, and um, we're going to be doing a survey, for example, around aspirations in, in, ten of, in the 10 countries we're looking at. Um, that's a project that Maastricht is also working in and um, the website is going online tomorrow, so you'll be able to find out more information about um, Make Next tomorrow. Um, the other project is um, the GCRF South South Migration Inequality and Development Hub, um, which is uh, um, an even bigger five-year project on um, on South South migration um, and um, and the links with inequality and development, and um, where we're looking at six South South migration corridors and. In that project, I have a work package on, on, my, on migration perceptions and migrant decision making. So I will have five years to, to, to look at these questions further. And I'll be looking specifically at the Egypt-Jordan corridor, the Nepal-Malaysia corridor, and at the Haiti-Brazil corridor. So I'm done with my presentation. So.